It's because all of the repair and the restorative mechanisms and stuff that our bodies are built with, you've heard our cells are designed to heal themselves, but not if you don't sleep because you don't get to go into hyperdrive with your restore and repair. So guess what? Your central nervous system that controls the way you think and remember and, and be patient with your you know, spouses or at work or whatever. So you're snapping off, you can't remember something and you're super tired and you think you have dementia. You don't have dementia. You didn't go to sleep. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't stop. We don't, we don't, All right. we don't stop. I said we don't, we don't, we don't stop. We don't, we don't, we don't stop. Outside, inside, we don't stop. Go, go, worldwide, we don't stop. From the bottom to the top, we don't stop. From the birds to the block, we don't stop. Outside, inside, we don't stop. Global, worldwide, we don't stop. From the bottom to the top, we don't stop. From the birds to the block, we don't stop. by delivering as much real information as possible. As a renowned cardiologist, he is committed to delivering first-rate heart care, as well as translating medical and health details into relevant and practical keys everyone can use. Why put off till tomorrow what you can do today? Welcome to the Waymaker 2023 Summit, today's health panel, Dr. Courtney Hollowell and Dr. David Montgomery. We can do better than that. Let's hear it for the doctors, y'all. Two, two. I'm so excited for this conversation. Yeah. As evidenced by the fact that I didn't even want the intro video to play. I said, come on, let's get right into it. <laughs> um, you know, this is such an important conversation because oftentimes as black men, we don't talk about health. There are a few things we're gonna talk about. What are some of the unique challenges that black men face with our health, but then we're gonna be solution oriented and we're gonna talk about how we can mitigate common uh, health occurrences that we deal with and how can we foster wellness in our communities. But before we get into that, I would love to just talk to you, Dr. Dave, why did you become a medical professional? I think it's good to, to frame why this has become a passion for you. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, we have to say that a lot, or at least write it a lot when we apply for medical school and all that stuff, and I didn't have a really good answer. I was 10 years old when I started saying I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. Um, there was no doctor in my family. My pediatrician didn't particularly care about me. I don't know where it came from. It's kind of one of those things. This is what you're meant to do. And who am I to, you know, second guess that? So it started there. The cardiology piece came, my dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack at 53. And although I don't think that was a part of the forward thinking as a 22, 23, 24 year old guy, um, it certainly was, right? I mean, if you think about it, right? So I'm now trying to figure out how do we stop people from having what my dad had? So that's essentially it. Wow. Uh, I would simply say that uh, medicine runs in my blood. Yeah. Um, Your dad you know, was a doctor my, as well. My, my dad, uh, is a urologist, my brother's a urologist, my sister's an internist, my wife's an OBGYN, my wife's sister's a psychiatrist, my, uh, it just keeps going on. My sister's an internist, uh, it just keeps going on. And, uh, you know, my dad always said, uh, you know, because as urologists we deal with uh, sometimes urine in the blood. And he always stopped me when I was a kid and said, you know what, it's better to have urine it's better to have blood in your, uh, to have blood, uh, urine running through your blood than to have blood in blood your in urine. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, oh boy. But I, I'll say that <laughs> what brought me to surgery is, um, you know, I think you have to have a calling, right? And I think sometimes it speaks to you. And uh, I think the first time I saw an operation, instead of me looking at, wow, okay, these are the steps and look what this guy's doing, what was going through my mind is, man, I could do this better than him. Yeah. Mm. And I, I right away thought it clicked and I understood spatially what needed to be done. 
And uh, I knew, um, you know, right from that moment that I was not only going to be a doctor, but I was going to be a surgeon. Powerful. That's a calling. Yeah, we're talking about the doctor side of it, but I want to get into the patient side. Why is it so damn hard for us to go to the doctor? <laughs> yeah. Why is it hard for us as men when we have an ache? Even me, myself, I didn't realize back problems running my family until my dad had a major surgery recently. So now I go to the chiropractor, et cetera. And I thought that I was just supposed to live with this pain. I gotten so used to it. Right. And it felt uncomfortable to say that I have a pain. Why is that? Yeah. No, this is, this is you know, people are trying to understand this because it's not just black men, it's men in general, right? I mean, we live in a society where we are taught strength, over everything else, right? You're not supposed to feel, you're not supposed to have emotion. Um, and maybe going to the doctor reminds you of when you last went. Many of the uh, males that I talked to hadn't been to a doctor since they had their last sports physical. Now, everybody in here remembers the physical, the sports physical. How many of you could tell your mother and your father, I don't want to go do that? You couldn't. In other words, you didn't have a choice. Name me a, a, an undertaking where a man wants to, by definition, give up his agency to somebody else. Mm. I'm not gonna, I don't have any say. And then you're going to do to me things that I don't necessarily want you to do. What we taught, you know, you know children was there are some things that people are going to do to you that you don't want, that you don't have any say in. If you have a daughter, raise your hand. How many of you want that message to go to your daughter. We don't want that message to go to our daughter or our sons. So imagine that there are people who have been abused, right? We don't talk about that. You know, not many males are going to talk about the abuse. So we harken back to that and we say, first of all, maybe if I was never abused, my agency's gone. I'm not down for that. Number two, if I was, I'm never going again. There are a number of reasons like that. Um, the, another one, and I'll stop here, is that you just don't want to know. You want to have the idea that you are virile, strong. Man, don't tell me that, man. That's, I'm healthy. I exercise five days a week. I eat a vegan diet, right. right? Here's the principle. Nobody has a perfect physiology. I used to joke, I don't do this anymore because my wife said don't do that anymore. I used to say, I used to want Beyonce to have a perfect physiology. Even Beyonce <laughs> doesn't have a perfect physiology. And this is not cast versus. This is just everybody, no matter how high you put them, nobody has a perfect physiology. Here is the key for us as men. Let me figure out what's not perfect about my physiology. It's going to be different from his, yours, and everybody else's, and take really good care of it. That's the key. Absolutely. Look, this concept that... Uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, it's true. You know, we're raised entirely different. And many times women try to f spend a lot of their try time trying to figure out why we tick the way we do. But to be honest, a lot of this has to do with learned behavior, right? Um, we were talking about this earlier, about how we, all you have to do is look to a playground and see when a young man falls on the ground and when a young lady falls on the ground. When the young lady falls on the ground, we all walk over there, run over there. How are you? What's going on? We got to get this checked out. But when a man skins his knee or a boy skins his knee, you're all right. Suck it up. Tough it out. Boys don't cry. Right? And so this concept of being vulnerable and being hurt and wanting to get it checked out is not something that you can do because that's not what men do. Right. And so the other problem is, is one and this concept of saying, look, as as children, you went to see a pediatrician. But ultimately, after that time period, most men don't see anyone. Right. The only reason why they go to the doctor is because they broke an arm yeah. or they got appendicitis or have a hernia. Otherwise, they're going to try to steer as far away from a doctor as possible. The problem is, is that women, on the other hand, they go see their obstetrician gynecologist and they start being taught the importance of prevention, the importance of screening. And we don't know that information. Mm -hmm. For us, we don't understand that concept. In fact, what we'll say to ourselves is, hey, men are like ostriches. We keep our head in the sand and hope 
that what ails us passes us by. Unfortunately, there's nothing in your life that works that way. You just ignore it and it goes away, right? It gets worse. It gets more acute. And the problem is, is that because men don't understand the concept of prevention, we don't understand when you, when now I got high blood pressure and diabetes and I'm thinking, wait, why is this a problem? Because we don't understand that we need to take care of these things before they become a major problem in your life, right? They ultimately result in major problems like heart disease and stroke and all these things. So the other problem is men think because they feel fine, they're healthy. Mm. And that's not necessarily true, right? Someone who has high blood pressure, early high blood pressure, may not feel anything. Yeah. But unfortunately, we think to ourselves, I feel fine, so I'm healthy. I think the first thing I want to tackle as we get into what wellness looks like is this mindset. You guys said something very poignant that I don't want to glaze over. You said, this is learned behavior, which is encouraging because that means it can be unlearned. Exactly right. That's and why you, we're here. That's why we're here. And you said that uh, no one has a perfect physiology. I never heard that before, that it's normal to be abnormal in that way. So... I would say if there were a couple of points that you could, that you want us to key in on to change our mindset around wellness, what would some of those points be? I think first bullet point might be accepting that all of us have something wrong with our physiology. Yeah. What are some of those other things that we should be thinking about to change our mindset around? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think if we zoomed all the way out, I think um, if we know that we have an imperfection in our physiology somewhere, how do we figure that out? Um, what struck me, oh, you know, I treat a lot of celebrities in Atlanta, and what struck me is that the people who are very wealthy are saying to themselves, you know what, my life is really great right now. How do I figure out how to have more of that? How do I figure out how to run this back over, <laughs> over and over again? And they are sitting with people who, who are experts in different fields with a strategy, to develop a strategy for health. I ask my patients all the time, High functioning people, really smart, academic, very well, um, you know, very successful. Do you have a health strategy? We all say this. I'm going to say this and you would do a call and response. Your health is your wealth. Do you really believe it? If you don't know what your health is, right, and you can't know just by, <laughs> right, you can't know. Because as Dr. Hollowell says, not everything that can harm you hurts. Not everything that can harm you hurts. There's some stuff that can be happening. And the only way to get that is to go hire somebody, different context, go hire a physician to help you figure out what it is. Do you have a health strategy? The health strategy is just like your business strategy. We've got entrepreneurs, raise your hand, entrepreneurs. Bunch of entrepreneurs. You can't even get a loan without a strategy. But your businesses are gonna do extremely well. You may not be here to enjoy the fruits of your labor. You see how I put that out there? Your businesses are gonna do extremely well, but are you doing that just so you can pass it down to your kids? I doubt it. You wanna see what that's like too. So be like these very wealthy people and say, let me sit down and say, what's my vision? What's the mission strategy, right? What does it look like? What's my first objective? I might wanna lose 45 pounds, right? I wanna get off blood pressure medicine, right? Whatever it is. How do I do that? Who do I hire? What are the people? You can have people. You can have a banker, accountant, right? You have to have a doctor, a physical therapist, a dietitian. What does it cost? How much is it going to cost me? Right. So go down a strategy. I think that's the message. That, that's. I feel convicted. You ever hear something at church and you be like, Pastor, talking about me, ain't he? Because <laughs> that's for me. I'm so proud of my ability to plan and do things, <laughs> researching interviews. I got my iPad up here. I ain't never ever in my goddamn life thought about coming up with this part of my language. I've never thought that's about real. coming up with a health strategy and taking it as seriously as I take my wealth strategy. What are one of the points yeah. that you would add to that? Look, too? this is a very big point that's being made. You know, so many times we'll say to ourselves, I need to lose weight. I need to, you know, I don't know, um, you know, communicate better with my wife. Mm -hmm. I need to quit smoking. You know, the difference today is that uh, successful people, they don't use the word should. Mm -hmm. Successful people convert their shoulds into musts. 
right? So many of us are shooting ourselves, all, shooting all over ourselves. And unfortunately, <laughs> you've got to get to a point where you change those shoulds to an active process, right? An actionable process. And I think you'll find that successful people have a plan and a strategy to accomplish that, right? Um, we want to get, when it comes to health, we're trying to help you get these health objectives off your vision board. I need you to get it into a plan, right? We want you to figure out the way in which this can actually be realized for you, right? There's so many things that we have on our vision board, and a lot of you are here today and are, are wishing for some of those things, but we want to figure out how can we translate that vision board into reality for you. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a patient who is a smoker. Now, every smoker knows they need to quit smoking. I don't know a smoker that says, what, I got to quit smoking. This is good for I, you. I, I, I should be doing this. But, um, and, and I think the data suggests that, you know, 70% of smokers want to quit smoking. It's only about 30% of smokers that are actually at that point to make that difference in their life. But you have to get from the point of, okay, I know I need to quit smoking, to I am quitting smoking, right? And as a physician, we have to arm you with a successful strategy to be able to do that. You can't go home and say, I, I got to lose weight. If you're not armed with the details that are necessary to lose weight, you're just going to not lose weight. And if you do lose weight, you're going to gain it all back again. Same thing with smoking. I'm, I want to take this off bit by bit. We'll start with the low-hanging fruit because I like this idea of positioning this the same way we look at wealth strategy, right? But the thing is, for all of you who started your business, I bet it was daunting when you first hired that first accountant and when you first filed those business taxes. When you first do all those things, it's very intimidating. So I want to take the intimidation out of this health plan that we're coming up with. Let's start with the low-hanging fruit. Why is it important to sleep better? What can we do to better to sleep, to sleep better, to get better sleep, how does that affect our overall health? Because I think we underestimate how that is one of the key foundational pillars that can help us uh, live wealth wealthier lives. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I, when I think about these, you know, ultra wealthy, when you think about what they're doing, they're not doing something so newfangled compared to humans in the 1900s or 1500s. Human beings, are pretty much the same as we were back then. We haven't evolved out of, you know, the 1700s very much. So the pillars that Dr. Hollowell and I were kind of talking about, I had this fantastic conversation yesterday, we should have recorded that, <laughs> around what are the four things everybody should do? Sleep is one of them. Raise your hand if you feel like you get adequate sleep. Just raise your hand, right? It is, it's a, it's a major problem. Every organism sleeps. Every organism is impelled to sleep. Impelled, what I mean, uh, right? It's a little grogginess. What is that? What's that thing? Mosquitoes sleep. Did you know there's a period of the day you can go out, the mosquitoes are not out there? Early in the morning, okay? Flowers sleep. Why is that? It's because all of the repair and the restorative mechanisms and stuff that our bodies are built with, you've heard our cells are designed to heal themselves but not if you don't sleep because you don't get to go into hyperdrive with your restore and repair. So guess what? Your central nervous system that controls the way you think and remember and, and be patient with your you know, spouses or at work or whatever. So you're snapping off, you can't remember something and you're super tired and you think you have dementia. You don't have dementia. You didn't go to sleep. You know what we hear? Oh yeah, no, no. I'll sleep when I Let's turn on the clock. <laughs> we used There's, to say that proudly, too. No, I mean, you yeah. know, it's in rap songs. It's everywhere. Yeah, Let me tell you, suckers. Hustle on sleep. the data are really clear on this, y'all. And that's why we have to have our conversations like this, because you may not know it. It's my job to tell you that, listen, um, if, you, uh, if you don't sleep, you die sooner because you develop a bunch of problems. And your waking hours you're not really awake. You're not thinking straight. You think you're good when you're awake now? Wait till you get seven hours. That's the recommendation. Plan seven hours of sleep, and you will not even believe how much you can be productive. I'll leave it there. Yeah, because I ain't got no sleep today myself. <laughs> yeah, We're going to work on it. A few days is okay. Look, 
we spend a third of our life asleep. So clearly, it's a very important function for all of us. And I think the older we get, the quicker we realize how important it is for us and how the lack thereof really affects the way we function. Yeah. Right. And so I want to key in on some points that were that, that are going on about sleep. So a couple things. The first is, is that when you don't sleep enough for the men in the room, many times they're like, oh, I need to my, my testosterone. I need to take supplements. When you don't sleep enough, your testesterone goes down. Boom. Sleep when like a baby. You could, that's all imperative. <laughs> yeah, not, not all imperative. I need like that. Like the the will. That's <laughs> Every man asleep. in here sleep. <laughs> what you sleep? sleep right? I can. <laughs> so, so what you're saying about how this is a restorative process that does all of these things for us, it actually has a lot to do with even how you procreate. Right. So if you are not doing these normal mechanisms, the way life has worked for you, the way you're put together is you, know, you shouldn't be sending that seed to the next generation. Mm. Right. Because there's problems with you. Mm. OK. And hopefully today you'll see in, in disease many times a lot of these things affect the way hormones work in us. OK. For, for example, another one that many men in this room have is obstructive sleep apnea. Right. We snore, and next thing we stop breathing, and then we breathe, and, and, and you know maybe our spouse or a significant other is telling us, man, I can't go to sleep next to you, or I thought you were dead last night. Right. They're telling you this because you have an obstruction that's happening in the back of your throat, and it's preventing you from oxygenating in an appropriate way, and it is you're almost dying every night. But this problem can have long-term effects for you. Even though for you, you're like, well, what's the deal? Well, the first is, is that you're probably noticing during the daytime, you're a lot more fatigued than normal. Mm -hmm. But there are much bigger things that are going on in individuals who have obstructive sleep apnea. They have issues with heart disease, congestive heart failure. They've got low testosterone. They're usually, peop any person who doesn't sleep enough, Maybe ask yourself if you, you know, studying for something or you're staying up because you're trying to prepare for something. And you notice during that time when you start really getting sleepy or the next day, you're hungry too, right? It increases your hunger hormone. Most people who don't sleep enough, they're overweight as well. They're more likely to be diabetics as well. So sleeping is a major issue for us. I want to end with a concept of sleep that has to do with every single one of you, and that is getting up at night to urinate. As we get older, the likelihood of having problems with our prostate increases. And because of that, I want you to think of the prostate it's like a donut. The urine goes through the hole. And as we get older, our prostate gets larger. It's one of the very few parts in our body that as we continue to age, continues to get bigger. And that hole continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you're not eliminating as well as what you used to. And many times we just think in our mind about, well, it's as good as it's been. But if we think back when we were 18 years old, we're like, whoa, this isn't nearly the same way. But unfortunately, what happens is that he's like, hey, man, I need, I need that 18 year old urine. <laughs> that chuckle got me nervous. I'm like, what's going <laughs> on? What's going to happen in 20 years? What's going on? Yeah. But the truth is, is that as we get older, it becomes more difficult for us to urinate, and we don't completely empty our bladder. And when we have more urine left over, we feel like we need to urine more often. And we go to bed, and then we wake up and have to go, and then we wake up again and have to go. What's the problem with that? The problem, actually, most patients perceive their quality of life being heavily degraded from the fact that they have to wake up multiple times at night to urinate, it affects their sleep. I want to jump to some audience questions. Uh, I'm going to read some. Yeah. g I'm going to get a couple of them for yeah. me as well. I want to go to this first one here because it goes right into what you're talking about, about quality of sleep. How impactful is stress on physical and emotional health? Because some of us want to get seven hours of sleep, but we're thinking about all of these things before we go to bed. How do we mitigate our stress and how impactful is stress on our health? Oh, so, I mean, look, uh, you know, when we think about stress, um, most people who have problems sleeping, now many of you will say, that's me. The minute your head hits the pillow, 
we're going through laundry lists. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 you know, thinking about all different, going over today's and tomorrow's issues, even though you're not going to solve any of them while you're laying on the pillow, right? And, you know, this laundry list of things start rolling through your head, almost like, um, you know, the opening credits to Star Wars, you know? Uh, you know, just <laughs> keeps going. A long time ago, in a, in a you know, galaxy, long time, way ago. <laughs> But, you know, the problem is, is that we keep going through this stuff and we perseverate. Some of us have that perseverating personality. And so that becomes very difficult because you become anxious at night. You start watching that, that, that uh, you know, the clock. Um, and then stress starts to occur, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Now, when you think about your bed, when you think about your pillow, you're an anxious about the fact that, you know, this is what's going to happen, so when it should be your sanctuary. So, so celebrate. You you, but, but what's, what's, what's to celebrate again? Facilitate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do that word just, I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> So, so how do we stop that? that yeah, no, I mean, so, so we're, we're not saying that it's easy. So I'm not trivializing that there is difficulty sleeping. What we're saying is, have you even sat down and thought about it? Do you have a strategy for it? Nah, nah, man, it'll be okay, right? I used to do, I used to burn the candle at both ends. That's what we're almost taught as, right. as trainees. But when, it's, that's like an adolescent, right? Oh yeah, I'm good, there's no consequences to my actions. You have to sit down and say, this is my health issue. Remember, everybody has something. This is mine, let me figure it out. Right, you can't think like a, a boy, right? When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like, a, I even reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, let's finish it, I had to put away childish things. Just childish to think, I'm just gonna not sleep, not feel good, and it's not gonna come home to roost. And then the young boy that you raised doesn't have a father because you died at 60. We're not trying to be macabre. I'm shooting straight with you because these are things you have control. Only you have control over this. Nobody can take you to go get your sleep evaluation and to do what it takes to get the sleep. Here's what I'm going to put this on everybody. This is a universally uh, recommendable thing. Seven hours of sleep. I literally had to graduate and say my whole life and world is uh, is, is sort of designed around seven hours of sleep. Mm. Do it for a week. Mm -hmm. you, will you take that challenge with me? Yeah. Do it for one week. Bad. Try to get seven hours. If you can't get seven hours, then you know that you're done. You gotta figure out what that is. Seven hours, raise your hand if you're gonna get seven hours. Give me one week, seven hours. Your life, as the kids will say, will hit <laughs> different. <laughs> You want to go to the audience and grab yeah, a I wanna, Yeah, I'm going to go to the, the audience and see. Who, uh, who got a question for the doctors? Anybody got a question? Way in the back. How you doing, my brother? Can you come up? Because uh, they, they told me the mic ain't going to reach all the way back there. I think, I think my battery going no dead. No wires on it. Yeah, it's wireless, but you know, we're we dealing with a budget. Uh, <laughs> what's your name? Brandon. And uh, what question you got for the doctors? My question is, at what age? I'm 34. What age should I start taking my, getting my prostate checked? That's a good question. Great question. That's deep. Well, I would say that um, you know, prostate cancer is one of those things that um, you know, not all sizes fit every single individual. But what I would say is simply, as an African American male, you are at high risk for not only prostate cancer. In fact, you have the highest risk for prostate cancer than any ethnicity in the world. But in addition, you're twice as likely to die of prostate cancer than anyone else. So uh, it's something that does need to be taken serious. Um, I, I tell people, usually I tell black men around the age of 40 to 45, I tell them to get a baseline PSA. Mm -hmm because PSA isn't specific to prostate cancer. It really is just, you know, it can be a big prostate, it can be, you know, an infection in your prostate, it can be a lot of different things. But what we wanna know is a baseline. Why is that? Because if a male between the ages of 40 and 48 years of age, their PSA is less than one, the likelihood that they will die of prostate cancer is incredibly low for that individual. So now we're looking at it different. We're saying, okay, can we forecast forward? The main point I just wanna draw to your attention is because how we understand prostate cancer is entirely different than how we understood it even 10 years ago. I'll tell you that there are three different types of prostate cancer. 
right? If you were on a farm and you had in, an imp- in, in a gate, you know, pigs, you've got the pigs, meaning the ones that are never going to get out the gate. You don't need to worry about them. You're going to die with them, not from them, okay? And then you have some that act as birds, meaning they uh, will fly away. They're going to get outside of that pen, out of your prostate, and they can kill you very easy. Those are the highly aggressive ones. And then you have the middle range ones. They are, call them chickens. And maybe they can, you know, flap their wings a little bit and get over the, the, uh, the gate. That's going to be a problem. So we're going to not kind of pay attention to the ones that are going to be clinically not meaningful to you and pay attention to the ones that are going to be clinically harmful for you. Got any, uh, one more, another question. Yes, sir. Come, yeah. yeah. No, the mic, I told you, the mic don't really work. <laughs> What's your name? Robert. Your opinion on coffee? Um, so, it, that's hard just because um, one size doesn't fit all. You're going to hear it a lot, but it's really true. Remember, everybody's health is like a fingerprint. Um, there is enough data that says that there are some very health, full, healthy um, components and compounds in coffee apart from the caffeine. And then obviously there are people who, even if they get a little bit, their heart's racing, their blood pressure's higher. How do you know where you fit? You gotta know what your blood pressure is. There is no man in this room that should not know what his blood pressure is, just kind of a general sense what it is. I don't care about that, I feel great, we just said. Not everything that harms you hurts. And in order for you to understand, can I drink coffee? How much of it can I drink? Obviously, moderation is kind of a human sort of, you know, uh, 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 norm, right? We know that we should try to keep it in the middle of the road. But can I even drink a little bit without harming myself, without being able to feel it? You've got to go and hire some specialists to help you figure it out. Um, And that's an individual thing. I got a a question. And... And how do we get black men to go to the doctor? You know, because we kind of afraid to go to the doctor. How do we get black men to go to the doctor? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's, you know, part of what we're all agreeing, that all of the things that go into why we don't go, something happened to, you know, a friend, they got put on a medicine, you think that the medical establishment is in cahoots, there are a lot of that stuff. You start thinking back to history. We have a lot of really good reasons to be afraid of it. Um, but that doesn't, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking at a, a bunch of afraid men. We've got to figure out how to be afraid and do it anyway. I love that. Amen. That is the perfect, perfect way to book in this conversation. I wish we had more time, but I think we got our doctor's orders. First, we're gonna develop that health strategy, right? We're gonna get seven hours of sleep every day this week and take inventory of how good we feel. And what we started to get to with the coffee conversation, we wanna eat well and take our nutrition seriously. You guys can stay in tune with Dr. Dave Montgomery via his show, The Good Doctor TV online. Dr. Courtney Hallowell, thank you so much for being here today and speaking with us. Did you guys enjoy this conversation? I was wonderful. I'm, I'm about to get some more gems backstage, actually. I got some things to talk about. My name is Doma T. Pongo. I'll be conducting the next conversation in just a moment. So I'll see yeah. you guys. Hold, 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 hold. Uh, thank you, doctors. I appreciate it. Y'all give them a hand, man. Yes, they saving sir. lives. They saving lives.